plan reportedly crafted and perfected by Iran's security apparatus has made a potential Israeli attack one of the most consequential and possibly catastrophic geopolitical missteps Israel could take in the modern era. Over 2,000 Iranian missiles are believed to be in position, primed for any eventualities as tensions rise across the Middle East. With increased military movements from both Israeli and U.S. forces, many experts anticipate an all-out assault on key Iranian military facilities. However, the Iranians appear to be one step ahead, preparing not just for defense, but potentially for a full retaliatory response that could cripple Israel's capabilities. The Iranian strategy is believed to include the unveiling of advanced military hardware, including newly developed fighter jets, long-range missiles, and cutting-edge drone technology. Some reports suggest that Iran's air force might rely on a secretive warplane capable of executing devastating strikes on Israeli jets, especially during vulnerable moments like refueling. This would enable Iran to target and eliminate Israel's warplanes before they even reach Iranian airspace, ensuring a swift and efficient response to any aggression. Alongside this, Iran's extensive drone capabilities, some of which have been demonstrated in past regional conflicts, are poised to play a critical role. These long-range drones, equipped with advanced evasion technology, are strategically positioned to deter or neutralize any foreign aircraft attempting to penetrate Iranian airspace. This potential conflict, which many commentators, including Colonel Douglas McGregor, are closely monitoring, has been brewing for years. McGregor, a retired U.S. colonel and seasoned military strategist, has warned that the situation could quickly spiral into one of the most brutal confrontations since the end of World War II. He contends that Israel, backed by the full might of the U.S. military, may be underestimating Iran's power and resolve. According to McGregor, the belief among Israeli leaders is that regardless of the outcome of an initial strike, the U.S. would inevitably intervene to ensure Iran's defeat and impose a regime change. This belief, however, might be one of the most dangerous miscalculations in this looming confrontation. McGregor has highlighted that the desire for regime change in Iran has been a persistent goal in Washington's strategic playbook for decades. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's current push for a strike on Iran is seen by many as a continuation of this policy, aimed at curbing Iran's influence and halting its technological progress. Iran's success in developing sophisticated military technology and achieving self-reliance has positioned it as a major regional power, challenging Israel's ambition to be the dominant force in the Middle East. This rivalry has become a core motivator for Israeli leadership to push for a decisive confrontation with Iran, hoping that U.S. support will ultimately tip the scales in Israel's favor. What, um, what do we know of Israel's plans to attack Iran? Well, I, you know, this is, this is the uh, is this $90 guesswork million dollar question. Is this guesswork at this point, Colonel? No, well, it's not really guesswork. First of all, there there are lists of all the things: power plants, uh, you know, water purification sites, as well as uh, oil production facilities. Uh, is Iranian bases, particularly for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Remember, just as I pointed out that Hezbollah in Iran know pretty much where everything is in Israel. Israel knows where everything is in Iran. So it's it, this is the age of persistent surveillance. There is not much that you can do without being detected, especially if you have any sort of electronic or thermal signature. So there are a lot of thing, a lot of places they can strike and do very serious harm. We have been preeminently concerned about the impact, obviously, on global markets of an attack on oil facilities, uh, especially Carg Island. At the same time, you know, we're also very concerned about any attempt to penetrate the mountain where, you know, the Israeli, or excuse me, the Iranian uh, nuclear facilities are located because they're hundreds of feet beneath the surface. And most experts have concluded that the, uh, the potential to penetrate hundreds of feet below the surface is not very good. You can go a certain distance, perhaps 100 feet, 200 feet, but 
much beyond that, it's very, very difficult. So there's a hope that that will not happen. And then finally, hovering in the background, you have this fear of an Iranian nuclear capability that they could rapidly transform their existing stocks of enriched uranium or plutonium into warheads, which I think is probably real at this point. If you didn't want Iran to, quote unquote, get the bomb, then you shouldn't have done what you've been doing for years, which is threatening and bullying and pushing Iran. So I think that's also in the background. But the bottom line is this, and this is what people in the United States really need to understand. In the South, uh, Hamas is alive. Has it been damaged? Of course. Is it being annihilated? No. Uh, in the North, you have Hezbollah. Has it been damaged? Of course. Is it annihilated? Absolutely not. So effectively, the Israeli Defense Force has failed in those two areas. They haven't been able to bring those areas under control. Right now, if you, if you turn on Israeli television, officers are talking about, we may go a, a kilometer or two or maybe three or four kilometers into southern Lebanon, but we're not going to drive to the Latani River as we have in the past. We can't do it. So you've got a, something of a stalemate, which from the standpoint of Hezbollah and Hamas is a victory. For the Israelis, it's tantamount to defeat. And in the midst of this, you have the prime minister who has now stated publicly he will attack whatever he thinks should be attacked in Iran, regardless of what we want or do not want. Mm. And you, you'll remember that over the weekend there was a piece, I think it was in the Washington Post, I could be wrong, it might have been in the New York Times, where the uh, journalist asserted that uh, Mr. Netanyahu might conceivably be looking for an off-ramp, in other words, a willingness to step back from the maximalist objectives, and therefore the next Israeli strike on Iran would not be uh, you know, everything that Israel has to offer. In fact, it would be scaled back. Well, since then, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, I don't know where this information came from, but that's absolutely false. And then, of course, we've had these leaks in the press where we, we've leaked deliberately, I guess, the discussions that we've had with the Iranians about asking them to exercise restraint. These things are completely damaging. So right now, I would say that both sides, Iran and Israel, have no interest in exercising much restraint. They may hold back behind the nuclear threshold, but everything else is fair, fair game. And I think the Israelis will throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at Iran when the time comes. That's where we stand. And this is this is a last-ditch effort, Judge. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu doesn't have very many good cards to play. He's got thousands of American servicemen and women sitting on ships in the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean. Uh, we can't keep them there in perpetuity. The Navy is literally cannibalizing itself to, to continue to operate with some measure of effectiveness as it is. Our armed forces are not in particularly good shape. Our missile inventories are low. And remember, you've got to go back into port in most cases to rearm. So when we get involved in anything, we have a, fair, a fairly short burst of capability, go back and reload, and then return to the launch site at sea. These are things that Mr. Netanyahu knows. That's one of the reasons that the terminal high-altitude air defense system was deployed to Israel. And people talk about the missiles, but the truth is that what is really important about the terminal high-altitude air defense system is the radar. The radar is brilliant. It's probably unmatched anywhere in the world. It's one of the best things that we have ever produced. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you set that radar up in Washington, D.C. somewhere, and you point it towards the south, you can track a basketball at 500 feet above the ground in New Orleans. Think about that. That's the kind of resolution this radar provides. The reason I'm emphasizing that is that the missiles, we may exhaust the missiles that we've sent very quickly because you fire two or three missiles at every incoming target. But the radar is key because the radar can cue large numbers of systems all over Israel to focus on where the enemy is coming. And that's very, very important. So 
So this radar is is the crown jewel of what we have to offer right now in air and missile defense, and he's got it on the ground. The problem, of course, is the Iranians are aware of what I've just said, and it'll be a very lucrative target when the fighting begins. You uh, mentioned Netanyahu uh, unloading everything but the kitchen sink. If it were to come the other way, if the Iranians were to unload everything but the kitchen sink, would Israel survive? Israel is going to have a tough time. Uh, let's let's be frank. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your other guests have told you similar things. They can. The Iranians are capable of leveling large parts of, of Israel. There is no question about it. That's why it makes no sense from Mr. Netanyahu's standpoint to withhold anything from his attack on Iran because he'll try to destroy as much as possible of Iran's capability to threaten and destroy him. It's, it's only natural. I don't think he's going to be very successful, but we'll see. Uh, he has the advantage of our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, uh, space-based and otherwise, and I think that will help enormously. But will it be enough uh, to prevent the arrival of large numbers of hypersonic missiles and ballistic missiles on target in Israel? And that I can't answer, but I think it's going to be very difficult for Israel, you, uh, uh, regardless of what they do. You were speaking not too long ago about uh, the U.S. Uh, leaking information. I can imagine uh, leaking the accurate contents of communications with the Iranians is going to terminate their communications with us. But among the leaks using their favorite place at which or to which to leak the Washington Post was this uh, letter that supposedly was sent to Prime Minister Netanyahu that if he doesn't allow humanitarian aid uh, into uh, Gaza in 30 days, I don't know why 30 days, but 30 days, the United States will consider a halting military supplies 30 days and consider. It doesn't seem a very precise or threatening threat to me, but do you think it's realistic? Would the Biden administration ever say no to Netanyahu? Would they say, let food, water, medicine, and fuel in, or we'll stop sending you bullets, weapons, ammo, and spare parts? The short answer is no. In fact, uh, a good friend with a lot of years of experience inside the intelligence community said it very well to me. He said, when the time comes and Mr. Netanyahu wants something from the United States in the event of the next attack with Iran, he's not going to ask for anything. He will simply make demands and we will meet those demands. I think we have to understand that this is very much a case of the tail wagging the dog. Here you have a nation of at least when this began, of a little over 7 million Jewish Israelis plus another million Arabs that are living inside Israel's borders. I mean, the current borders, not including Gaza and the West Bank. Right. And uh, we are a nation of what? 330, 340 million. And we are now hostage to whatever Mr. Netanyahu decides to do. Those are the facts. He's in control. He's been in control from the very beginning. And while he has control, I think he's going to use it because there is no guarantee after the November election that he'll be able to do then what he's doing now. Uh, I know that a lot of people are saying, well, you know, President Trump will give him whatever he wants. But if I were Mr. Netanyahu, I'm not sure that I would buy that argument. I think I would probably act now. And that's his best bet of dragging us into something. And again, if you look at this theater high altitude, or excuse me, terminal high altitude air defense system and its radar, and the roughly 100 American soldiers that are part of this, a lot of people are treating this as some sort of tripwire. Well, the truth is we've already got tripwires. We have those things in Iraq and Syria. And when President Trump was in office, he wanted to get our soldiers out of those places precisely because we could not defend them in the event of a high and conventional conflict, which is what we're looking at with Iran and Israel. The, the terminal high altitude air defense is not necessarily a tripwire, but it does signal that we will probably lose soldiers on the ground in Israel, on Israeli soil, if this fight continues. His hope that that will be enough to trigger all out war between the United States 
and Iran. But I'm not sure that that would necessarily happen. Yet despite Israel's confidence in its military superiority, Iran's growing arsenal of advanced drones and missiles is becoming a critical factor in the equation. McGregor points to recent events, such as attacks on highly sensitive Israeli targets, including an assault on Netanyahu's residence and a strike on the dining room of elite Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, Special Forces. These incidents have demonstrated that Iran possesses both the technological capability and the willingness to strike at the heart of Israeli power structures. The IDF, renowned for its intelligence and operational precision, has faced surprising setbacks, which should serve as a warning to Israeli leadership. Iran is more prepared and capable than many in the West realize. McGregor also referenced a leaked classified document that allegedly revealed Israel's plans to strike Iranian facilities. This leak, combined with Israel's perceived underestimation of Iranian capabilities, has raised alarms among military analysts. The Israelis now find themselves in a precarious position, unsure of whether their long-crafted battle plans can withstand the meticulous countermeasures Iran has put in place. According to McGregor, the fact that Iran has already formulated a comprehensive strategy to neutralize Israeli aggression should be deeply concerning for those pushing for a military solution. He warns that Israel's over-reliance on U.S. military backing could lead to catastrophic consequences, not just for Israel, but for the region as a whole. Commander of Chinese troops fighting with UNIFIL attacked by the Israelis. My God, can this get any more complex or dangerous? Well, I don't think uh, they're fighting with UNIFIL. UNIFIL is not there to fight anybody, as we know. This is well, a peacekeeping. Well, it can shoot back when it's sh shot at. Of course. And and by the way, uh, the, the incidents that we've seen thus far involving Irish troops that happen to be part of that organization, the Irish soldiers have be, behaved with commendable restraint. And, and that's the point I was trying to get to. I before. guess that's because Ray McGovern was not their commander. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Uh, no, listen, you, you don't want hotheads running the show in CENTCOM, uh, and we certainly don't want a war with Russia and Iran. That's the point. That's why let us assume that some American soldiers are killed. Do we instantly commit the entire United States, all 340 million people, our scientific industrial base and the armed forces to all out war? I don't think so. And I think that uh, I'm sure that the CENTCOM commander has received some very specific orders on that score. Professional soldiers, especially their officers, are expected to exercise restraint and control over their emotions. And however angry they may be, they understand the consequences of their actions. And no one wants this war. Mr. Netanyahu does, but we certainly do not. Here's uh, the president of France responding to what he believes were deliberate targeting by Israeli armed forces on French troops working with UNIFIL. Cut number two. It is totally unacceptable for UNIFIL troops to be deliberately targeted by Israeli armed forces. We condemn it. We do not and will not tolerate it happening again. Before you respond, here's what he said this morning in a full screen. We don't have the tape of it. Mr. Netanyahu must not forget that his country was created by a decision of the United Nations. Therefore, this is not the time to disregard the decisions of the UN. What do you think, Colonel? Is Europe going to get involved in this? No, <clears throat> I don't think so. Uh, the Europeans are not really capable of very much. And I certainly uh, understand the sentiments expressed by Mr. Macron but he's very unlikely to become involved in a direct confrontation with the Israelis. If anything, he's probably had back channels from us telling him to butt out, which I suspect he will probably do. The Israelis are riding high in the saddle. And by that, I mean the arrogance and the self-confidence that arrogance sometimes breeds is out of control. If you watch Israeli television, when the people are discussing in panel settings what's happening, 
There is no sense of the casualties that have been taken already in Gaza or in South Lebanon. There is no sense that Israel could lose, none whatsoever. Uh, their news is as carefully predigested and disseminated as our own. So the real question, which is what you began this with, was will Israel survive it? Y you and I and others who are looking at this and hopefully looking at it objectively are sensing that it might not. Iran's drone program, in particular, has emerged as a game-changer in the evolving power dynamics of the Middle East. These drones are capable of bypassing some of the most sophisticated air defenses in the world, including those deployed by both the U.S. and Israel. The ability to evade detection and deliver precision strikes gives Iran a significant advantage in any potential conflict. McGregor stresses that Israel and its allies should not underestimate the effectiveness of these drones, which have already been used to devastating effect in various conflicts across the region, including in Yemen and Syria. Iran's mastery of drone warfare represents a new era in military confrontations, where traditional air superiority may no longer be the decisive factor. Moreover, Iran's missile capabilities, particularly its long-range ballistic missiles, present another formidable challenge. With over 2,000 missiles reportedly positioned and ready for launch, Iran has the capacity to inflict significant damage on Israeli cities, military bases, and even U.S. installations throughout the Middle East. These missiles are not only numerous, but are believed to be equipped with advanced targeting systems, making them capable of hitting critical infrastructure with a high degree of precision. For Israel, this presents a terrifying prospect. Any preemptive strike on Iran could result in a massive retaliatory attack that overwhelms Israel's missile defense systems and inflicts widespread devastation. The complexities of this potential conflict go beyond the military dimension. Geopolitically, a war between Israel and Iran would have far-reaching consequences, drawing in regional and global powers and destabilizing an already volatile Middle East. For the United States, which has long been a close ally of Israel, the stakes are equally high. While Washington may be inclined to support Israel in a conflict with Iran, the cost of such an intervention, both in terms of human lives and geopolitical fallout, could be immense. The U.S. has spent decades trying to avoid another major war in the Middle East, and a direct conflict with Iran could drag the region into a prolonged and bloody conflict with no clear end in sight. In conclusion, while Israel may feel compelled to confront Iran in what it perceives as a necessary move to preserve its regional dominance, the risks are staggering. Iran's well-prepared military, equipped with advanced drones, missiles, and potentially secretive warplanes, is ready to retaliate in force. Colonel McGregor's analysis underscores the danger of underestimating Iran's capabilities and the assumption that U.S. intervention will guarantee Israeli victory. If Israel and its allies proceed with a strike on Iranian facilities, they may find themselves facing a far more formidable and resilient opponent than they anticipated, leading to a conflict that could reshape the Middle East for generations to come.